The title of this video may strike some as a rather bizarre question to ask. After all, isn't Israel a nation spoken of within the Bible made up of 12 tribes? The answer to the question has implications that extend far beyond one simple video such as this. But the fact that so many theologians have spent such a great amount of time on this topic gives an accurate insight into just how vast and important this topic is. The importance of Israel, as most mainstream theologians see it, typically has a lot to do with well-guarded presuppositions rather than Israel herself. For instance, the covenant theologian's process of covenant renewal or supersessionism has the logically necessary outcome of seeing the nation of Israel as one nation that, through the process of covenant renewal, ultimately results in the church being the renewed nation. While dispensationalists, emphasizing the eternal, unchanging nature of the old Mosaic Covenant promises, tend to see Israel as consisting of only ethnic Jews. The ramifications of each of these positions, of which they are the primary ones, are extensive and far-reaching. Much of Covenant theology and dispensationalism, at least the old forms of these systems, have been refuted and adjusted over time, not always for the better too. But New Covenant Theology, not to be mistaken as a newer form of Covenant Theology, has headed a lot of the trench work in carving a new road, a biblical one. And although it has a few glaring issues here and there, such as the overemphasis some proponents give to the completion of the covenant promises of old, the completion of the Law and the Prophets, and when the Old Covenant Law ended and was replaced by the Law of Christ, just to name a few, the system itself is proving to be incredibly robust. The eschatological persuasions of people tend to see Israel in light of the old paradigms of covenant theology or dispensationalism. Israel is either the church or the nation made up of ethnic Jews. But there are some problems found within scripture itself that create rather glaring problems with these theological models. Let's start with covenant theology. We only have enough time to list out some of the primary issues. So one. Paul speaks of the inability to change a covenant once the covenant is established in Galatians 3.15. This clashes heavily with the covenant theologian's position of covenant renewal, where covenants add and subtract details over time through the process of renewal. 2. The promises made in the past for land and an earthly kingdom are spiritualized away from the original intent and context found within the Old Testament passages. This creates a problematic hermeneutical issue in which one can reinterpret what is plain and obvious in light of the new so as to burn away at the pages of scripture. The lens of the new becomes the means by which the old is redacted and altered. 3. There is a distinct inability to recognize that the promises given to Abraham and his seed were only ever intended for Christ, not all ethnic Jews, as per Galatians 3, 16-18. Obviously, there are other issues with this system, but these three complicating factors are so insurmountable that the system itself should be abandoned. I understand that abandoning a system feels risky and uncomfortable, but allow me to reassure you that there is a better way, a biblical one. Let me also list out some of the major dispensational problems too. 1. Dispensationalists see the nation of old as being the ones to have the Abrahamic promises made to. Like the Covenant theologian, they make the same mistake of assuming the promises were made for all ethnic Jews when they were only ever made to Abraham and his seed, who is Christ. 2. They refuse to recognize that Yahweh divorced the nation of Israel thousands of years ago and that the promises given to them stemming from the Mosaic Covenant were lost. Perhaps the strongest example of this is found in the book of Hosea, of which Paul himself quotes in his letter to the Romans. The prophet Hosea is told to name his son Lo-Ami in Hosea 1.9, which means, not my people, and I am not your God, as referring to the nation of ethnic Jews. In other words, to see the old nation as being the people of God simply by way of genetic affiliation is biblically unwarranted. As the prophet Jeremiah states, I gave faithless Israel her certificate of divorce and sent her away because of all her adulteries. Yet I saw that her unfaithful sister Judah had no fear. She also went out and committed adultery. Jeremiah 3.8 3. 
They tend to have a difficult time recognizing the realities of the New Testament and the progressive nature of Revelation, where it is clear that the New Testament writer, as carried along by the Spirit, is interpreting the Old Testament in a way that obviously deviates away from dispensational teaching. Dispensational interpretations of the Old Testament become the arbiters of what the New Testament writers can and cannot be teaching, even when it is abundantly clear that they are saying something different. A strong example of this is in the dispensationalist's inability to see the nation of Israel as having lost the promises given to them under the Mosaic Covenant, a conditional covenant that depended upon their obedience. Now, of course, both dispensationalism and covenant theology have come a long way, and many concessions have been made by advocates of both camps. But the fundamental problem of Israel remains. While the covenant theologians cannot seem to separate the nation of Israel and the church, the dispensationalists cannot seem to get them together at all. So, what is the answer? New covenant theology provides us with a starting place. For the new covenant theologian, there exists at least two Israels. There is the Israel that was under the Mosaic covenant only, and there is the Israel that was to be born later, in Christ. And this was the nation to inherit all of the promises, through Jesus, to who all of the Abrahamic promises were made. Paul's detailed explanation of how the promises have not failed in Romans 9 begins from this very premise, mainly that there is an Israel within Israel. That is, there are at least two Israels, of which one is a remnant and the other consists of the majority. There are children of flesh born under the Mosaic Covenant, and there are children of promise, children predestined to inherit the Abrahamic promises. This, as the New Covenant theologian points out, ties into the shadow and substance of the two Israels, with the Israel of the past providing an archetype from which the second Israel is the substance or fulfillment to. A passage often cited by these theologians is found in the book of Matthew, where Matthew quotes Hosea. There, Matthew says the following when referring to Jesus. So he, Joseph, got up, took the child, Jesus, and his mother Mary during the night, and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. Matthew 2, 14-15 Matthew's quoting of Hosea here is a good example of the shadow and substance relationship between the Old and New Testament. And here, regarding Israel, we see that Jesus is referred to as Yahweh's son, whereas in the Old Testament passage of Hosea, the nation of Israel, the nation under Moses, is itself referred to as the Son of God. The echo here of the conditions of Jesus' life provide us with evidence that Jesus is the fulfillment and substance to Israel of the flesh. Jesus is the Israel of God, but not only him. As Paul writes in Romans 11, when referring to the olive tree that is Israel, the olive tree had branches upon it that were removed. Paul is actually utilizing Jeremiah here when he speaks of this. Now if some branches have been broken off, and you, a wild olive shoot, have been grafted in among the others to share in the nourishment of the olive root, do not boast over those branches. If you do, remember this, you do not support the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off so that I could be grafted in. That is correct. They were broken off because of unbelief, but you stand by faith. Do not be arrogant, but be afraid. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will certainly not spare you either. Romans 11, 17 to 21. The Lord once called you a flourishing olive tree, beautiful with well-formed fruit, but with a mighty roar, he will set it on fire and its branches will be consumed. Jeremiah 11.16 Within the context of Paul's message, it is very clear that the olive tree refers back to Abraham and even before him. It refers to the root, who is Christ. Which is why all with faith, even those before Abraham, are included within remnant Israel. Remnant Israel begins in eternity with the root. And all who are covenanted to him some through the Mosaic Covenant, these being the ones cut off, and those being of the Mosaic and Abrahamic, through their faith, are joined to him in some regard for some time. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. 
I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. Revelation 22, 16. Branches are broken off from Christ, the root of the olive tree, that is, remnant Israel, because of their unbelief. And other wild branches, those from the Gentiles, are added due to their faith and connection to the root. The analogy provided by Paul here refers to what he is talking about earlier in chapter 9 mainly that not all of Israel is Israel, and that not every physical descendant of Abraham is his child. Or to put it this way, not every Jew belongs to Jesus, who is the seed to who the promises were made. Not every Israelite is of remnant Israel. Some were only connected to him by the flesh through the Mosaic covenant, of which the Lord divorced and annulled that covenant because of their unfaithfulness. Of course, there are many prophecies that speak of the nation of Israel's restoration, but the restoration of the nation will not be under the Old Covenant, the Mosaic Covenant, but instead under the New Covenant, Christ's Covenant. What this means is that Scripture affirms that there are at least two Israels. There is the Israel of old, the one who Yahweh divorced and who does not inherit the promises, she is the harlot who prostituted herself to other gods, and she makes one final return at the end of the age, as the book of Revelation highlights. And there is the younger Israel, who comes as the second son. This is Jesus, and all who are connected to him through faith. This aligns too with the many stories of the older and younger sons within the book of Genesis, who provide another example of shadow and substance. Just like Isaac and Jacob, both sons who were born second, and both to who the promises were made because of their predestined faith, Christ arrives, like them, as the second son, the son to who all of the promises are given, while the first son is never intended to receive the promises, and is instead broken off from the remnant and sent away. As Paul says, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. And this was before the two boys had done anything good or evil. The two nations that struggled within the womb of Rebekah, as per Genesis 25-23, were not Edom, Esau's descendants in Israel, but Israel of the flesh and Israel of promise. The two boys wrestling were a sign of the disputes and long-term conflict that was to come between the two peoples within the land of Israel. The children of promise and the children of flesh would struggle against one another for thousands of years. So then, who is Israel? Well, Israel and Israel are brothers, which is why they look so alike. They are children raised by the same Heavenly Father. But make no mistake, only one of the children to only one of the nations were the promises given to Abraham ever intended. Only one receives the promises while the other is cast out of the land. And the one who receives the promises of land, of which Abraham walked the circumference of, is Christ, and all who are attached to him. The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Scripture does not say, and to seeds, meaning many people, but, and to your seed, meaning one person, who is Christ. Galatians 3, 16. Tell me, you who want to be under the law, are you not aware of what the law says? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the slave woman and the other by the free woman. His son by the slave woman was born according to the flesh, but his son by the free woman was born as a result of a divine promise. These things are being taken figuratively. The women represent two covenants. One covenant is from Mount Sinai and bears children who are to be slaves. This is Hagar. Now Hagar stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem because she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem that is above is free and she is our mother. For it is written, Be glad, barren woman, you who never bore a child. Shout for joy and cry aloud, you who are never in labor, because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband. Now you, brothers and sisters, like Isaac, are children of promise. At that time, the son born according to the flesh persecuted the son born by the power of the Spirit. It is the same now. But what does Scripture say? Get rid of the slave woman and her son, 
for the slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with the free woman's son. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we are not children of the slave woman, but of the free woman. Galatians 4, 21-31